Hey, today we're gonna to talk about AWS S3 storage classes and which storage class is right for you. So let's get started. Hey, so we've talked a lot about Amazon's AWS S3, which is their uh, storage product offering. And I love this product. I use it all the time for storing files. But under the hood, there's a couple different storage classes that you can choose uh, depending on what kind of files you're storing and how you're going to use that data. So today we're going to talk about the different storage classes, including your standard, your infrequent access, and uh, your Glacier access. And some of those have sub tiers to them. And there's also an intelligent tier that you could use. But most importantly, there's some gotchas, especially when it comes to pricing. So picking the right storage class is, is really, really important for your data to make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck when using Amazon's AWS S3. So today we're gonna to talk about the different storage classes, some of the gotchas when it comes to the pricing, and uh, some use case scenarios about why you might choose which storage class for which project. So with that, let's go to the computer and get started. Okay, so like I talked about before, there's a lot of different Amazon storage classes. So I'm gonna quickly kind of walk you through them and the, some of the pricing differences. And then I'm gonna show you how you can actually uh, set your bucket or subfolders in your bucket to different storage classes. So uh, let's get started right away. So I'll go ahead and you can just Google um, like Amazon storage classes. I'll, this particular link from Amazon, I'll put in the description below. Uh, and it just talks quickly about the, the types of storage classes that are available. Um, so we're gonna go through those very, very quickly and talk about some use cases. So you've got your general purpose. This is kind of your safest bet one, but it's it's also one of your most expensive. So um, this is gonna be just for just general use. Uh, if you wanna put files in there, if you wanna be accessing those files fairly regularly, then standard use is, is a really great product for that. Intelligent tiering will kind of straddle between uh, your standard storage and your infrequent access. So just, We'll come back to that in one second. So in infrequent access, that is a little bit cheaper to host, but you pay a penalty for accessing the files out of infrequent access. So then if you go back to um, your intelligent tiering, which is here, um, it's basically, you're not sure what needs to be an intelligent tiering, or sorry, what needs to be an inf infrequent access or what needs to be in standard. This is really like a really good use case example for this is like a company um, network file share. So uh, if you are using your S3 bucket to share out for your whole company, you don't know what files somebody accesses once a year and what files people access every single day. So intelligent tiering is a really great service for that. So you dump all of your files into there and Amazon will make kind of a, an educated guess and have some algorithms that are behind the scenes as to uh, whether or not it should be in standard or in frequent access. So when it moves it to infrequent access, you start saving money um, because it's, it's saved at that level instead of standard. Standard obviously, obviously costs more to store in. But the really cool thing about intelligent tiering is that if you pull something out of infrequent access that it put in for infrequent access for you, you don't pay a retrieval fee for that. Um, so the trade-off is if it puts it into infrequent access, it's not quite as cheap as if you put it in infrequent access but you also don't pay a penalty when you pull it out. So like I said, it's a really good uh, application for network access shares. Infrequent access, this is really good for um, backups uh, and, and like backups that you are very likely to go pull out. So again, if you have a company network share, maybe you have a, a NAS that's inside your network and you're just replicating that NAS to S3, we do this all the time, and a user is likely to delete a file or something like that, um, you know, you wanna go get that back from your backups, then you could do infrequent access. They're still cheaper than doing infrequent access, but uh, that's one of the use cases. If you wanna save a little bit more money, you could do uh, one zone infrequent access, and all that means is that when you write something to Amazon's S3, they write it into multiple data centers in that region. When you do one zone, it only writes it to one data center inside that region. So it's a little less reliable than your standard storage options, uh, but it's really good if, you're, if you can reproduce that data very readily, right? So if you have, again, if you, say you have a NAS on-prem that's rated and you have USB backups on-prem and you're using Amazon's S3, uh, but you wanna just you know use one, one zone to save a little bit of money, you could do that. And then if you lost your files in one zone, you at least have two more on-prem. I don't recommend it. For personally, it's it's not really worth the money savings, and we'll talk about how much that is in a second, but um, that is an option available for you. 
Uh, and then you've got Glacier. So just kind of high level, you have your standard, you have your infrequent access, and you have your Glacier. And then in Glacier, there's Glacier and Deep Archive Glacier. And these are just two options that are really, really great for just storing archival data or backups that you very, very, very likely do not need to know. Uh, you just need to dump files into there, and um, it'll be very, very cheap to store it into Glacier, and it will cost more to pull it out. So again, in standard, you, there is no retrieval fees. Uh, infrequent access, there are some uh, some infrequent. Sorry, there are some retrieval fees, and then in Glacier, there's higher retrieval fees. So the trade-off that you store it cheaper, but if you need the files, then you have to pay for it. So I really like Glacier for those uh, backup scenarios where it's very unlikely I'm going to need them. We do also have like piles and piles of data that we just need to keep for tax purposes or whatever it might be. So I'm just going to shove it in a glacier to be as cheap as possible. And if I get audited and I need to pull those files out, or if I've had a building catch fire and I need to get those files out or whatever, then I'll pay the penalty then. Uh, but if those chances are pretty low, then I'll just store it in glacier for cheap uh, archival storage and then just pull it out of glacier when it's time to go. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview. You can read more of the details in this page here of this of the storage classes. Okay, so let's just talk about pricing for a second and I'm gonna show you the calculator. But if we click on pricing and then click storage, uh, there's a couple different options here. So you have your standard storage, which is very straightforward. You're gonna pay this much per gig. It does change based off region. So wherever you're gonna store your data, make sure you select that region. And this is gonna be your, your per gig rate. And if you do intelligent tiering, like we talked about earlier, then you're gonna have your um, frequent access tier and then your infrequent access tier. And then you can see you get a little bit of a price drop on there. And if you do infrequent access, you're gonna see even more of a price drop. So Again, if you're looking at standard, you're looking at uh, 2.3 pennies per gig versus 1.25 pennies per gig if you did infrequent access. So it's a, a reasonably substantial savings to do infrequent access. And then if you go Glacier, it's even, even cheaper at 0.4 of a penny per gig. And then uh, a deep dive archive is even substantially cheaper, right? It's not even 0.1 of a penny per gig. So um, there's a lot of different options in there, but I really want to highlight something because this will definitely catch you. It has caught me off guard is these asterisks. So you have these double asterisks on the glacier and you have your single asterisks on infrequent access. And so if we go down to that, the biggest thing, basically what this is saying is that if you put something into infrequent access, it, you have to pay for that storage for 30 days. So if you put something into infrequent access for two days and then delete it or rewrite it or anything like that, um, you're going to pay for 30 days of that. So an example is, if you put a one gig file in uh, into infrequent access for one week, and then you delete that file, or if you rewrite that one gig file, you are gonna then now pay for two gigs for a month. Uh, if you've rewritten the file, if you've just deleted the file, you're just gonna pay for that one gig. But you, every single time you put something into infrequent access, you automatically pay for that storage for 30 days, regardless if it lived in that storage for less than that. And then the double asterisk for Glacier is it's the same thing, but it's 90 days. Um, so those are the two big gotchas that uh, infrequent access and Glacier access is not very good for backups if you're gonna keep you know, rewriting the files into those buckets. Um, because then you're basically, like if you rewrite that bucket every week, you're basically gonna be paying uh, four times the rates because you are paying for 30 days of storage at the moment the file gets written, even if you delete it, even if you overwrite it. So that's very, very, very important to keep in mind when it comes to intelligent tearing and glacier access. And I'm stressing that just because I got caught off guard by it one time and uh, I didn't realize that it had that overwrites. I didn't read the asterisks and uh, that, that can definitely rack up your bill. So uh, just keep that in mind if that's what you're using it for. Um, and then so let's just flip to the calculator, run through a couple scenarios, and then I'll show you how you can actually move your data over. So if we go to S3 uh, calculator, just quickly Google this. Click Amazon S3, you pick the region that you want. So before we were doing Ohio, but most of the time, the cheapest regions are using the US data centers. So as long as you have no problems with your data being in the US, you can use the US data centers. They are often the cheapest. So again, if you wanted to put, say, um, 100 gigs into S3 standard, you're gonna pay $2.18. But let's say we wanted to put that into infrequent access, 100 gigs into infrequent access, you're gonna pay $1.25. So you're already seeing a lot of savings there. If you wanna use that NAS scenario that we talked about, so let's just say you have 100 gigs of, of data and you think 30% of that's gonna be not accessed at a 30-day period, 
then now you're going to pay a dollar ninety nine for that hundred gigs using some of it in frequent access and some of it in standard storage. And then intelligent tiering will do that. This thirty percent, you're just guessing. There is no real way to control intelligent tiering on how much will or will not be moved to infrequent storage. It's just going to make that up on its own. Um, and then, of course, if you wanted, if you had a hundred gigs of files that you just wanted to archive for a very, very long time, you could then go down to Glacier if you wanted to do that, and then that's going to cost you forty cents. So substantially cheaper. And if you wanted into deep archive, the biggest thing here is that if you're in Glacier, you're going to be able to get your files back within hours to days, it's, it's not going to be all that long. Where Deep Glacier is going to take a little bit longer, I think upwards to a week, to get your files back. So it really depends on how fast you're going to need those files out of Glacier um, in that event that you actually do need them. So if you put them into Deep Glacier, uh, you're going to pay 50 cents. So that's, um, let me just make sure I did that properly. That's Deep Archive. Yep, yeah, I have it du du duplicated here. So that, because it seemed a little, yeah, so it's going to cost you 10 cents. So you can see in standard, it was just over $2, and you go as cheap as $0.10 cents a month if you did deep archives. So picking the right storage class can really save you a lot of money, depending on your use case. Okay, so we've covered the pricing and uh, the options and features of the storage classes. So let's actually go ahead and create a bucket and uh, move some files around into different classes. So uh, go ahead and log into your Amazon console. I'm already logged in here, and you're going to search for S3. And we're going to create a bucket. So I don't have any buckets in this account right now. So I'm going to go ahead and create a bucket. And we're going to call this storage class testing. It's really important that your bucket name is completely unique, that no one else in the internet has at all come up with a storage uh, bucket name. Um, if it, there is one, it'll tell you at the next step. It'll say, hey, somebody else has already come up with this name. I'm not going to really worry about any of these features about versioning or log requests or anything like that. I did have another video uh, covering some of those features, so I'll put that in the description below if you're interested in covering some of those features. Okay, so here we got storage class training uh, testing, and in this bucket I don't have any files. So uh, there's a couple different ways of moving your bucket around. You can do uh, lifecycle management, so if you go to lifecycle manager, I can say, for instance, um, all the files in this bucket. So let's call this uh, the default rule. We're going to say the current version. So basically, all the files that are, are currently living in this, we can transition it to any storage tier afterwards. So we can say, you know, once a file has been written to the um, bucket, by default, it's going to go to standard. After, let's say, 10 days, I want it to go to the intelligent tiering. There's no real hard and fast rule, but what you should do here, it all really depends on your use case. But here's one way you could then um, move your uh, storage class of your files to one way or another. In the previous screen also, you can also just apply this to different folders. Um, it can be a little tricky to create all these. It's not hard, but um, it can be a little cumbersome to use their GUI. A tool that I really enjoy using is called um, S3 Browser, so we'll just quickly get that going. So you just quickly, you Google it. I already have it installed on this computer, but this is the website here, and I'll put that in the description as well. Um, so if I just fire up S3 browser, I just have to connect this now to Amazon. So I'll go ahead and uh, create a new account. And in order to connect with S3 browser, you have to create an IAM role. Um, so I'm just gonna do that now. Uh, I'm gonna go through it fairly quickly, uh, but if you want more information about IAM roles and how you can lock down your buckets, I also have another video about that, and I'll include that in the description. So go ahead and create a new user, add a new user. We're gonna call this storage class testing, just like we called the bucket. We're looking for programmatic access, which will just give us uh, access key and secret key. And I'm gonna attach an S3 uh, full access. Um, you should always limit your IAM policies as tightly as possible. Right now, I'm going to give it access to all my S3 environment. I only have one bucket, so that's not a big deal. Uh, but you should definitely not just have it full open to your whole Amazon account unless you absolutely need that, which is very unlikely. So here I have a, basically a username and password, an access key, and security, uh, sorry, secret access key. So I'm going to punch that into here. Storage. I'm going to call the account storage class testing. Here's the access key, and here's the secret key. You can encrypt your keys with a password. I recommend doing that with this app, um, but for what I'm doing for my testing, I'm not going to do that, but if you have it on your computer, I'd recommend it so that if you get a virus, the keys don't get compromised. Okay, so let's go ahead and connect with that account. 
There's that bucket that I created earlier. And let's go ahead and just upload a file to it. Okay, so I'm gonna create a file called test and then upload that to the bucket. So I'm gonna create a new text document, test. I'm gonna put it, this is a test, save that file. And then now I'm just gonna click and drag it into the bucket. So boom, it's there. And you can see the storage class is standard. So right through S3 browser, one thing I can do is I can actually just change the storage class. So I can change it to standard and frequent access, one zone and access, uh, glacier, deep glacier, or dark deep archive is a couple different ways of saying that, and then intelligent tiering. So if I wanna just move it straight to glacier, boom, I can do that. It'll do the API call and actually just move that file to glacier. Done, that's the storage class that that's in. You can mix and match in one bucket. You don't have to have um, all the files in your bucket attached to one storage class. So if I create a new folder called um, standard and I'm gonna create a new folder called infrequent access. So in the standard, I'm gonna put a new file. Standard file. This is a standard storage class and I'm gonna save that file, and I'm gonna go put that into the standard storage class. And then I'm gonna create a new one called infrequent access file, and this infrequent access file. And I'm gonna save that, and then here, I can actually go to infrequent access, and I can dump that file in there. So now, you can still see it says standard, so if I go back to the bucket, I can actually click this whole folder and I can say, move it to infrequent access. And so now this one file is in Glacier. If I go to standard, this file is in standard. And if I go to infrequent access, you're gonna see this one's in standard and frequent access. That's kind of a very easy way of setting up your bucket and dumping your files into different classes that you might uh, choose from there. You can have different buckets that are, they can have whole buckets that are in different classes or you can have subfolders or files into any mix and match uh, class that you want. So that's basically it. So that's basically using your S3 browser to select the different storage classes. And you can, like I said, you can mix and match. So uh, that's what we have now. We have one file in Glacier, one file in Standard, and one file in Infrequent Access. Back to the chair. So hopefully that helps you pick uh, some different storage classes to save you a little bit of money on S3. You really, really, really wanna be careful on those gotchas, especially with infrequent access or Glacier access. I once picked the wrong infrequent access uh, storage class for a backup system that I was using. And it's a it's a long story, which maybe I'll tell you guys another time, but we got a surprise bill for $20,000, um, which Amazon ended up reversing because there was a bit of an error on their side, uh, but there was also a misunderstanding on my part about that infrequent access. So I'm hoping this information might help you avoid that same surprise $20,000 bill and a dispute with Amazon. And also um, pick the right storage class for what project you're doing and you can save a lot of money. So if you guys have any questions or comments, be sure to uh, comment below. We're going to do another uh, video every Friday afternoon, so hit that subscribe button and we'll cover more topics like these. Thanks guys, have a great day.